Hello there, welcome back to Backyard Ballistics. Slightly different video than usual today, as you see this thing is in much better condition than what I usually display, but I have some really interesting things to show you about this. The reason why it's on my workbench is because it's not working and I'll have to repair it. There's something wrong with the trigger group, most of the times pulling the trigger won't fire the shot. So we'll take it apart, fix it and fire it for your viewing pleasure, all while understanding the features of this unique gun design. So this is the first type FG42. Well, it's actually an exact copy of an FG42, the peak of German wartime portable weapon engineering, when they tried to do the impossible and fell short of it. How short, we'll figure out in this video. But let me tell you a bit of history first. Everything starts in May of 1941 on the island of Crete. Not the gun development, but the military disaster that led to it. Possibly encouraged by the high effectiveness of their paratroopers in the early stages of the war, airborne attacks were relied upon by the Germans during the bloody battle for Crete known as Operation Mercury. However, things didn't go to plan. Because of the terrain, paratroopers had no choice but to land right under the guns of well dug in and prepared British defenders. The troopers that survived the landings had only their pistols and some machine guns to defend themselves since any larger weaponry, including rifles and machine guns, were too bulky to jump with and had to be airdropped separately inside dedicated containers, which by then were scattered all over the battlefield and reaching them required moving in the open under strong enemy fire. The Germans finally took Crete, but the death toll was unsustainably high. A strong need was felt for a rifle the trooper could jump with. But not just any bolt action rifle, it also had to provide the fire volume of automatic guns, but without the shortcomings of those small calibers of machine guns they already had. What they wanted was a single gun that could act at the same time as an infantry rifle, as an assault weapon, and as a light machine gun, all tasks that had, until that time, been each fulfilled by a different gun. As if this wasn't innovative enough for the early 1940s, the Luftwaffe also imposed some additional restraints on the design, like the fact that it couldn't exceed one meter in length and the weight of the standard issue infantry rifle. What at first glance already sounds like a very complicated task will turn out to be close to impossible. However, Rheinmetall accepted the design challenge and Krieg of the production one, and this is what came out of it. This is an exact, functioning reproduction of the first production FG42, of which only about 2000 examples were ever made, with only a portion of them surviving to our days. The gun needed to have the same range and power as the standard infantry rifle, so it was chambered for the same 8mm Mauser cartridge. To be able to exploit the power of the round efficiently, the barrel needed to be of appropriate length, and considering the whole thing couldn't be longer than 1m overall, this required making the action of the gun as compact as possible. The detachable magazine was then placed in a lateral position, allowing the pistol group to fit right under it. If they had chosen a vertical magazine, like is common nowadays, the pistol group would have had to be placed behind the magazine, lengthening the action. This way the action extends for a considerable length behind the pistol group, leading to a very stubby stock. As we said, the rifle was required to also act as an assault weapon and light machine gun, so it had to be self-loading. More specifically, it had to include both a semi-automatic and a fully automatic firing mode so that it could act satisfactorily both at close and longer ranges. This is the only thing where my gun differs from the original. This replica was tailored for civilian ownership, so the fully automatic functioning was completely removed from the design, and this example can only fire in semi-automatic mode. Being otherwise identical, it allows us to see the best of 1940s German engineering at work, something that really fascinates me. Similarly, I am impressed with the efforts done by modern game developers in understanding and accurately simulating the performance of weaponry. Probably the best attempt in this sense is offered by War Thunder, which kindly offered to sponsor this video. Possibly the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made, War Thunder is a free-to-play game available on PC, PlayStation and Xbox, where over 2,000 vehicles from over 100 years of military history, including tanks, aircrafts and ships, can be used by the player in combined arms PvP battles. The utmost attention is given to vehicle and weapon accuracy and realism. Each vehicle is modeled down to its individual components and a realistic damage model is devised. Vehicles suffer actual damage to their components and crew, with an X-ray damage view showing exactly what is happening. Also, the immense variety of vehicles gives interesting insights into how weapon systems evolved over the years. 
Play War Thunder now for free on PC, PlayStation or Xbox using the link in the description below. By using my link, and for a limited time, new players and returning players with more than 6 months of inactivity on any platform will get a large bonus pack including multiple premium vehicles, premium account, an exclusive 3D decorator and much more. Back to the FG42. Let's give a closer look at the trigger group, which is the main reason I'm taking this thing apart. As you saw, most of the times pulling the trigger doesn't result in the gun firing, but only in a clicking sound. So this bit here is the trigger here. It sticks out of the unit and engages this notch on the bolt carrier. Pulling the trigger should lower the sear, freeing the bolt carrier, which in turn fires the shot. However, something is not right. The sear only goes down a small bit and then quickly rebounds upwards. I think I know what is happening, but I can't see in there, so let's take this thing apart and assemble it back on the template so we can see clearly what is happening. Look at this. Before the trigger can be fully depressed, and therefore the sear fully lowered, this bit slips out of place, resetting the trigger. That bit is the disconnecting mechanism. It is what resets the trigger after each shot, so that only one round is fired for each depression of the trigger. It should get activated by the bolt movement, pushing this ledge out of the way as it passes over it. However, in my case it's activating on its own, and there's definitely something wrong with it. Now, before I make this right, a word of caution. Never mess with trigger groups on your own unless you're qualified to do it. Don't even take them apart. Even a small mistake can and will end up in an accident. Anyway, what is causing the problem is this tiny spring. Ah, bollocks! It got too weak and is not able to keep the disconnector in place anymore. Changing it with a new one restored the trigger group to its original functioning. Now pulling the trigger causes the sear to go all the way down and it remains like that until the disconnector ledge is pushed outwards, as it should be. Now the trigger group should be sorted but I haven't told you how this thing works yet, which is quite remarkable. Let's put ourselves in the shoes of the German engineers once again. Given the weight and size of the barrel, and with only a handful of inches and a couple of pounds of material to spare, they needed a miracle to make the gun work as intended. The self-loading capability is obtained through the use of a gas piston placed under the barrel. The gas piston also acts as bolt carrier, kind of similarly to the AK-47. To keep the reciprocating mass low, the piston was made as short as possible, therefore having to spill gas from the barrel quite close to the breech. Holes on the gas cylinder allowed excess gas to be vented out after the piston had gathered sufficient velocity. This wasn't the most comfortable thing to do though, since the gas vents are placed right where the hand of the shooter is. Even though this was enough to render the gun self-loading, getting satisfactory performance in full auto was another can of worms and was yet another challenge for the designers. First of all, automatic fire with rifle ammunition produces a lot of heat. For this reason, the barrel walls needed to be thick enough to soak enough heat before overheating. This however meant spending even more weight on the barrel that had to be saved somewhere else in the design. At the same time, the 8mm Mauser cartridge, with its almost 200 grain bullet and high velocity, tends to kick like a mule. On a bolt action rifle, that is not too big of a deal, but if you're planning on automatic firing, some action is required to mitigate recoil or the shot spread would be the same size as the broadside of a barn. The most common measure taken on light machine guns is adding weight to the weapon, but as we saw for the FG42 this simply wasn't an option. Three main features were used to mitigate the effects of recoil. First of all, a beefy muzzle brake was installed at the muzzle. The propelling gas has its own momentum and it normally contributes significantly to recoil. What the muzzle brake does is venting the gas laterally instead of letting it go forward so that its momentum does not contribute to recoil. However, the heavy and fast 8mm bullet has plenty of momentum on its own and not being able to cancel that as well, a way of making it less harmful had to be devised in the form of a recoil buffer. 
What you saw me remove at the beginning of the disassembly is a compact spring package that works similarly to a car shock absorber. It averages the recoil impulse over a longer period of time, therefore reducing the force applied by the stock to the shooter, rendering the weapon more controllable while shooting. But a final, even more unusual feature was introduced. You see, self-loading weapons usually either fire from a closed bolt or from an open one. The choice is dictated by the main intended use. Closed bolt firing allows for greater single shot accuracy since the bolt doesn't have to move in the time frame between trigger pull and ignition. On the other hand, open bolt firing is more suited for automatic shooting. The forward travel of the bolt before the shot, which hinders single shot accuracy, is instead beneficial in buffering recoil, reducing shot to shot spread. At the same time, since each round is chambered only immediately before being fired, there is no cook-off risk if the barrel overheats. The FG42 tried to get the best of both worlds. Acting on the fire selector on the FG42 not only changed the mode of operation from semi to fully automatic, but also from closed bolt to open bolt firing. This was obtained by the trigger sear being able to engage a different notch in the bolt carrier, which you don't see here because this replica is semi-auto only. All this complexity had to fit in a small and lightweight package, and that's where problems arose. The FG42, both first and second type, was crippled with reliability issues due to component wear and premature failure. Because of the weight restrictions, there's simply not a large enough safety factor on all parts but the battery itself, and all sorts of breakages occurred even during the official testing by Germany before adoption. Even though I was able to fix the trigger group on this example, we still encountered a lot of trouble during testing, with the main issue being failure to feed during cycling. It jammed. It jammed. Uh, okay, hang on. Start again. Yeah. The cartridge to be fed would get stuck while leaving the magazine, getting slammed by the bolt with so much force that factory ammunition came out bent in a banana shape, while my lightly crimped reloads totally collapsed under the force, which is a very dangerous situation, by the way. Remember when I said that the trigger group was one of the two main unsolved issues of the design? Magazine feeding was the other one. Adding to the technical issues, there were of course the financial ones. The complicated design and manufacture of the gun meant that the build was extremely expensive, to the point that a wartime US report by the foreign material branch of Aberdeen Proving Ground, on some captured examples, concluded that The FG42 has been produced with apparently little thought as to the difficulty and cost involved in manufacture. The cost of a weapon of this kind manufactured in the United States would be excessive. An attempt to improve the performance and reduce the cost of the system came in the form of the FG42G, also known as Second Type, that featured a state-of-the-art stamped receiver, but the gun still remained an overly expensive and delicate weapon, with the margin of safety offered not being up to typical army standards. Overall, less than 8500 FG42s of any type were able to be made before the war ended. So although incredibly technically advanced when compared to weapons of the same age, innovative, well ahead of its time and inspiring to many later gun designs, there simply wasn't a way of getting a single small and lightweight gun that could act at the same time as infantry rifle, assault weapon and light machine gun, and the FG42 ended up being one of the best examples of grass ball lose all in the field of portable weaponry. Before leaving you, I want to give a final thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Play the game for free on PC, PlayStation and Xbox by following the link in description below. That way you'll get a large bonus pack including multiple premium vehicles, premium account, an exclusive 3D decorator and much more. Once again, a huge thanks goes to my patrons, which as usual are all listed here. Thank you all for watching, subscribe if you'd like to see more and I'll see you next time. Bye.